All right, everybody. So let's get started. So quiet, please. So uh, our goals today are to continue to the discussion of IP networking. Quiet, please. So we're going to look at some high-level concepts around um, networking and the functionalities of the network. Um, and then we'll have a tour of the different layers of the network and specifically physical data link network transport and application layers. And as continue the discussion we started last time about uh, the successes and drawbacks of layering. All right. So why is networking important? Well, basically we've seen an evolution of computing from desktop systems and mainframe systems to fully networked systems that intercommunicate. Um, and increasingly, applications are moving from being installed on a single machine to living in the cloud um, and as web services. So the largest, many of the largest companies these days are basically cloud providers. So the network is the, the entity that makes all of this possible. So the connectivity provided for the network by the network is critical. Um, it's also the case that in terms of user experience, Difficulties with a network are among the most commonly cited problems that people bring up. So <clears throat> um, for the iPad 2, actually Wi-Fi connection is the largest complaint that people make. Um, for Kindle Fire, it's the second largest, um, the largest being that you can't, can't turn off one click. Um, the, so it's 35% and 25%. So they're you know, very significant numbers. Um, Okay, and what is a vacation? Anybody? Yeah, it's a vacation. Well, it, it is a vacation spelled with an F, but w there's actually several uh, interpretations of them. But the one that's interesting is taking a break from Facebook. Um, so in other words, people are so used to, t to being connected all the time that um, taking a break from being networked is considered a lifestyle change. So, um, all right, so uh, most of the apps that you'll use communicate with the network. Um, that allows the, the, uh, the app to provide a rich experience to use personalization and so on, um, provide better services to you, provide access to a vast set of resources that are living on the network somewhere. Um, <clears throat> and so search engines, social media tools, shopping and so on, uh, use the networking. Um, all right, so um, let's start working through some of the elements of networking. Basically, uh, the idea is to have processes running on different machines, working with the operating system to communicate with each other in a way that's as transparent as possible. So that requires physically the two processes to be uh, known to their operating systems, to communicate through uh, appropriate system calls with the operating system and then through some network hardware, either wireless or wireless, wired network cards. Um, <clears throat> many machines these days have multiple network interfaces. Um, multiple wired network cards are fairly common and um, laptops will normally have both wired and wireless interfaces. Um, so in fact, the devices can have multiple presences on the, the network. They'll normally have different addresses for each one of those. Um, so the addressing scheme um, for, for TCP IP is based on two different notions of, of address for the physical machines. There's a, a physical address, media access control address, uh, which is supposed to be fixed for each piece of hardware and each interface for the hardware. And then an IP address, which is a more dynamic entity that's while the device is connected associated with that specific MAC address. Um, and this is the address that's globally, uh, uh, globally presented through typically network uh, uh, directory services so that other machines can potentially find this host. And so this host, even if it initiates contacts, then return messages can come back to it. So, the first stage in, in networking is to make sure that we can make this association between physical addresses, which are unique and uh, attached to physical interface devices, and their network uh, 
presence, which is the IP address. All right, so, <clears throat> um, so for each MAC address, you'll, once the device registers itself with the network, uh, with a, a, a DNS server, it will receive an IP address as well. Um, that IP address will often change from session to session, um, but for as long as the device is connected and active, it'll have a static mapping. Um, and each other device will have the similar mapping from, uh, from MAC to IP. All right, so the MAC address is a 48-bit address um, that once upon a time it was unique and associated with a particular uh, instance of the hardware, like a serial number. Um, so it's a very large address space, enough for basically an arbitrary number of devices. Uh, modern devices typically have um, settable MAC addresses. People discovered that uh, it was very useful to be able to um, set the MAC address of a device to copy that of an older device so that you save having to re-register the device with a name server. So, um, but in theory, it's supposed to be unique for each different physical device. Uh, the IP address, by contrast, um, on IPv4, it's a 32-bit uh, address, groups of, um, uh, four groups of, of 255 bits. And for IPv6, it's a 128-bit address, which is usually a long hex string. Um, and that either assigns statically, if your network administrator is uh, typically for a server, you'll get a static network address. Um, for normal clients, it's dynamically set by a, a name service when the computer connects to the network. Okay. <clears throat> so in a connection um, is a communication channel between two processes through the OS and through the networking layer. So um, in addition to having addresses associated with the interfaces of the physical machines, the services themselves typically have a port number associated with them. So um, that's how a process here can connect, uh, say, with an HTTP server or an FTP server at the other end. The packets will carry both the address of the machine and then the address of the port that the process A is seeking a service from. All right, so yeah. Port A, in order to access um, the service at this end, the sending process will, always, will also have a port address, which is how process B can route traffic back in response. Um, all right, and here are some common port numbers for um, well-known protocols. And they start with very low-level protocols, wake on LAN for starting up machines uh, remotely on port number nine. And then a lot of familiar protocols, FTP and so on, through from 20 through to 23. <clears throat> um, DNS is at 53, and HTTP is is at port 80. Yeah. Right. That's coming up on a slide. Why can't we use MAC instead of IP? Um, MAC doesn't encode any uh, topology about the network. It's an arbitrary address. You know, two different machines could be in different parts of the world. Um, the network structure is designed to, to uh, encode the topology of the network, sort of from highest domain down to lowest. So that way, machines can find each other without having to have a director of everything, which would be required with a MAC address. So, um, <clears throat> so and the port numbers are quite significant because, um, you know, a lot of security these days uh, is about protecting and screening out particular port numbers very often only letting through uh, HTTP traffic. Because there's, for every service here, there's a potentially, potentially a vulnerability on the service at the other end that you might be able to exploit if you uh, send the wrong kind of information, send the wrong kind of packets. So port filtering is an important part of this too. OK, so um, <clears throat> all right. So the most important thing about the, the network is that deliver the packets. Uh, hopefully reasonably quickly. And if you want to deliver a packet, say, from Berkeley to um, somewhere in Tokyo, uh, you have a, a number of issues. The first one is reliability. There are many routers along that path. Um, there may, there, as you go up, typically 
higher in the network topology, there's more traffic, more congestion. So there's a good chance of packet loss somewhere, collision between packets. Um, and so you want to have a reliability layer as well. Um, flow control is important too. Part of the congestion control, especially at higher levels, is keeping track of um, how many packets are being sent on the network and how many collisions are happening. And protocols uh, these days, TCP in particular, has both reliability and um, flow control and congestion, congestion control built in. Um, so flow control is actually about dealing simply with the receive buffer and making sure you're not sending packets before the receiver is ready to receive them. Um, all right, so clearly if you have a mismatch between the endpoints, say a, a, a server trying to send to a phone, the flow control, the acknowledgments that the sender is going to wait for guarantees that you don't get um, too much information flowing too fast. Um, all right, congestion control um, is about avoiding collisions generally, and um, there, the, the clues to congestion include a lack of acknowledgments coming back. That implies collisions either with the outbound packets or with the acknowledgement packets coming back. And without congestion control, um, basically, if you think about it, because, it, again, the network... Uh, it's not exactly a tree, but it does involve a higher um, throughput of packets as you go higher up in the topology. So the, amount, the volume of traffic as you go up is getting larger and larger. And if you don't manage it somehow, um, you'll just have a complete overload situation. So we'll talk a little bit about how that's managed uh, at, at the lowest layers later on. So we don't want to... Clearly, we don't want to uh, let the network grind to a halt, so we, we've got to do that. All right, so <clears throat> um, we talked last time about layering. Layering involves uh, breaking down this complex protocol between a large number of, I, of, of services on the network and a large number of potential physical transports so that you have a manageable number of interoperating functions. The layering of uh, IP guarantees that each layer only has to um, use the services exposed by the next layer down, and um, it has to only export services to the layer above. And there's a simple encapsulation that we'll see, a kind of recursive encapsulation of packets as well that goes along with that. So this layering constrains and simplifies the kinds of uh, interaction that you need, hides the implementations of the layers, the details of implementation at the layers below and allows you to change various parts of the stack without affecting other parts. All right, so a service is um, a functionality exposed by a layer. Um, the service interface are a set of calls that use that functionality and that's presented to the layer above. The protocol um, specifies how uh, particular peers communicate in order to achieve that service. <clears throat> um, so the protocol, as we discussed last time, specifies uh, a syntax and a semantics of the communication. So syntax being the formal structure of messages that are going back and forth, and then the, the syntax being the meaning of certain particular messages uh, encodings, what actions should be taken, and so on. So uh, uh, an FTP request is both a, a message of a particular format, but also a, a request that packets should be coming back. So the protocol doesn't, though, specify um, exactly how those operations should be implemented, um, and especially uh, details of how the messages are uh, put together and decoded. All right. So um, the layering model that was originally designed to support complex systems, including uh, the internet, was the OSI layering model, um, which was developed way back in, in 1984. And it has these seven layers going from physical up to application layer. Um, and although it's a, a, an idealization that's worth 
shooting for, it's, it implies a, a really large amount of, um, of nesting of communication, and wrapping of packets, and a lot of overhead in, in implementing these, these layers. So IP simplifies the stack. There are only five layers in the IP stack. Um, the first four follow the OSI model, and the application layer just simply sits, sits on top of the transport layer. Um, it makes it a lot more efficient, and as it turns out, it's about as simple as the seven-layer model. All right, so let's look at the, the physical layer first. This is the, the wire or the wireless that moves the bits around between devices. <clears throat> um, the service here is to simply move bits between two hosts that have to be known and identified by um, their MAC addresses, their physical addresses. Um, <clears throat> the interface has to specify uh, at a physical layer how, uh, what's the meaning of the bits, how the bits have to change uh, to encode, or the signals have to change to encode the bits that are moving across the wire. Um, <clears throat> Uh, a protocol is a coding scheme. There are uh, various coding schemes that are used for, for physical transmission, especially over wireless. These can invo involve coding theory, um, exactly how you map logical bits to levels of the interface. It can involve error recovery and checking, forward error correction. So a variety of functions um, go into the, the protocol at this low layer. The idea is, though, to the end result is simply um, some block of bits going in and one end and coming out the other end. So examples of physical layer, originally um, Ethernet was uh, implemented using coaxial cable, which you could daisy chain between hosts. Um, <clears throat> for high speed networking, optical fiber can move bits faster than, um, than wires can. And We've seen many generations of wireless um, that are uh, now uh, working into the tens of gigabits a second. Um, <clears throat> all right, so uh, moving up a layer to this data link layer, the idea here is that we're starting to encode, messages, encode communication now as messages, um, which are logically simple, simpler to think about over that physical link. So, now we have uh, some additional services that we have to provide, including arbitration of access to the physical medium um, and possibly layers of reliability and flow control. So once we dedicate to packets, we, may, we basically go to expose uh, a process that can receive different requests from different um, processes trying to communicate through the network. So these arbitration and flow control primitives are necessary. Um, <clears throat> the interface that's exposed should be to send those messages or frames to other hosts and receive frames back. All right. <clears throat> um, the protocol will include an address, typically. Uh, so the MAC address of the device that should be the target. Um, and a, a media access control uh, protocol, which is a couple of examples here. Um, character sense, excuse me, carrier sense, multiple access, and collision detection is one of them. So, um, so we've moved up these two layers, and now we've gone from this physical layer to a, a, a packet, uh, packet representation. So now we'll actually have addresses in, we have frames first of all, and we'll have bit addresses encoded in those frames. So um, this is the first of many layers of, the, uh, of framing that happen in, in IP. At this lowest level, we get the outer containing headers. So these frames are going to encode what's inside a payload um, and simply specify how that payload moves around on a local area network. Okay. So um, MAC addresses. Uh, are always existing, they're just hidden perhaps under the IP address of your host, but they're easily exposed. Um, the commands on 
Linux and Mac or IF config and on Windows IP config. <coughs> so uh, running uh, IP config on Windows will give you a printout like this. It's going to list usually multiple devices. So the wireless LAN is here. Um, its physical address, MAC address is here. It's a 48-bit um, address there. The IP address, not shown here. Um, but the Ethernet adapter has both the MAC address and then the physical address here. In fact, it's got two of them. The uh, IP address, the IPv4 address is here. It's that group of, of bytes, basically, 32-bit address. Um, this is an IPv6 address, uh, which is 128 bits. Uh, it's sort of in a shorthand here. You can see some breaks between the blocks of four hex characters. Um, but this is, uh, this is the full address, which allows a much more extended address space than IPv4. OK, so um, all right. So the lowest level of the network is the local area network. So this is a bunch of machines that are communicating with each other. Um, and they're physically close to each other. They have basically a, a, a broadcast medium between them. Logically, it's a broadcast medium. Um, should use the same physical communication technology. So it could be a particular wireless network um, or a particular wired network at home or an Ethernet in an office. So those machines all know about each other and can communicate point to point. All right, so, um, so LANs share the same physical, uh, physical communication medium, um, which is a broadcast channel. Every frame is normally forwarded to every host on a LAN. So hubs are basically devices that have a different physical cable from each machine, but which forward all inbound messages to all of the other hosts. And um, so basically addresses, uh, so every machine sends out a, a, a packet. The lowest level packet will have an encoding of the MAC address, which is the intended target. And the, all of the machines receive that, um, the packet and will discard packets which don't match their MAC address. So that's, so the, the addressing at the lowest level layer, at the data, data link layer, is based on MAC address. All right, there's a packet. So it's actually going to be sent to all of the hosts. And um, if the intended target is B, it's only going to be processed by B and discarded by C. OK. So um, one level. Uh, of complexity higher than hubs is switches, which um, route traffic selectively um, based on the intended address, um, and therefore minimize the amount of bandwidth. So in contrast to a hub, which is going to forward to every wire uh, from that is connected to, a switch is going to selectively forward based on the uh, data link address. So packet to be. The switch is aware of all of the uh, addresses of the devices connected to it, and it's only going to forward to the um, device with MAC address B. All right. Um, <clears throat> let's see. So there's a few issues with uh, MAC protocols. Um, one of them is access to, to broadcast media, um, and the second one is avoiding collisions. So there are a few solutions. Most of these solutions are fairly uh, old in the history of networking. Uh, the one that's currently used almost universally is random access. But let's look at some of the others first. All right, so, so in channeling partition protocols, the idea is that this LAN, which is really uh, including all of the traffic between the machines, is going to be partitioned so that each machine gets an equal share of the bandwidth. The realization of this that, that's most common is in wireless protocols, including FDMA, which just means basically dividing the spectrum evenly between the hosts, um, and TDMA, which is another kind of wireless protocol, 
basically defines time slices that are shared between the hosts. So it's evenly defining a fixed wireless channel among different hosts. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, so basically all of the hosts can communicate at once. Most likely in wireless networking, they'll be communicating to a single um, access point and then receiving a message back. Um, but this protocol simplifies everything by basically not having to adapt the bandwidth of each, n each node according to the traffic from the other nodes. Um, and I mean, what part of the history of this too is that um, it was developed also for cellular networks where the idea is to provide each customer with a s consistent amount of service. Um, all right, so um, an another protocol that was used in early Ethernet was token ring um, protocols where basically in order to determine which host could talk, uh, there was an electronic token that moved around the network that was held by a node for a while, then they'd forward this token packet to the next node, and only the node that had the token could, uh, could uh, transmit to the network. So that, uh, again, avoids congestion control. You have a unique host. Um, it's quite similar to time division multiplexing in wireless spectrum, um, but it's a bit more adaptive because a host that wants to talk can send a long message then the token's gonna, if no one else is sending, it'll spin around and quickly come back to the same node. So it allows um, a node that has some data to submit to send a lot more than one over N of the share. So the disadvantage though, the reason this is not used much is that it, it does <clears throat> have a considerable overhead, especially compared to modern network speeds. In uh, each machine receiving, uh, deciding whether to transmit and then forwarding the token. Uh, that can involve a large amount of overhead relative to the amount of data going over the network. Um, and also if a node fails, then the token passing stops. Or a node could also cheat and perhaps uh, resend the token and cause all kinds of, of havoc and congestion. Um, all right, so these are simple protocols to understand though, um, where you somehow explicitly give control of some part of the network to a particular node. All right, the protocol though that is um, most commonly used is random access. And um, here the idea is to make a best effort to not collide with someone else. So the idea is to listen first <clears throat> to the medium, see if anyone else is sending currently, uh, and wait until there's nobody sending. Um, and then try, try to send. There's a small probability that between your last sensing operation and your transmit operation that somebody else also starts. So you still keep, uh, keep listening to the network though to make sure that if somebody else is talking while you're talking, you can detect that and then stop. So basically both of you have, have sent garbage because you've um, sent, the same, sent two messages over the same physical media. Most likely they're both corrupted. Both nodes in theory should stop at that point. Um, and then uh, both nodes though should choose a random delay time such that there's very low probability of them colliding again. So whichever uh, node picked the shorter random time will start. The other node should be able to recognize that they're speaking and then wait <clears throat> until their message has gone through. Um, so that's a simple scheme that works quite well. Uh, and so, and it's the one used in Ethernet, which has proved to be extremely reliable. All right, so congestion control, at least at this layer, is, is not too bad. Okay. So, all right, so let's pause for a moment. Um, this is a good po point to, uh, to take a pause and just review where things are. So project two code is due um, Thursday, tomorrow night, Halloween. Um, try to get it in on time. The uh, group evaluations are due on Friday. Um, we really want you to uh, try to get this one on, on time. There are only four slip days and I know groups of, uh, several groups use them already, some of them already on the first project. 
We do have automatic deductions, and you do have a couple of challenging projects coming up, so please try to get this, these ones in on time. So we have a bit of a problem with uh, some of the projects. Um, so I'm just going to review our collaboration policy. Uh, the policy is stated up the front of the course. So when you're working on projects, it is OK to discuss your design with other groups. Um, to make suggestions about code from another group, but you shouldn't use, obviously, copy or share code from other groups. Um, we discourage you from carefully reading other groups' codes uh, so that you, know, you generate your own ideas and what you submit is obviously distinct from what other people are submitting. Um, and in particular, we want you to not be copying or substantially reading code that's online or test cases from prior years, because unfortunately we've discovered a number of previous projects are online. Um, and there is a problem with some groups using that information and submitting. So unfortunately we've had to review uh, the project submissions from project one, and we'll have to take some action against some of the groups. So please don't get yourself into that situation. Um, the project deadline is coming up, but there's a help session today. Make sure you what, that what you submit for this project is your own work. Um, and let's please not see any more of this. OK. So are any questions? Any clarifications needed? All right, well, let's take a, a five minute break and we'll continue with a quiz right after.
All right, let's continue. So um, let's review some of the ideas about layering networking. Uh, so first of all, do protocols specify an implementation? Yes or no? No, OK. So uh, syntax and semantics, but, uh, but not implementation. Congestion control is about uh, making sure the sender doesn't overwhelm the receiver, yes or no? All right, false. So what is, what is it that's taking care of not overflowing the receiver? So uh, that's flow control, yeah. Um, a random access protocol is efficient at low utilization. True, yeah, I mean, it's not really, it, there's minimal delay because it's only listening for um, existing traffic on the network. All right. Um, and at the data link layer, Hosts are identified by IP addresses. Good. All right. Yeah, that, that's actually uh, the data link layer is below that layer. So their hosts are identified just by MAC addresses. All right. Physical layer is concerned with sending and receiving bits. Yeah. All right. Good. All right. So, um, so let's start moving up to more of the, uh, the interesting stuff. Uh, at the, uh, in the network layer, we're really starting to talk now about um, IP traffic. So uh, packets now include an IP address, so a global address that's the intended recipient, and they'll generally be traveling over multi multiple networks to get there. Um, at this layer also, we can have services associated with scheduling and priority and even buffer management. The interface is, is pretty simple. It's about sending these packets to specified network addresses and um, receiving packets that are, that are addressed to you. OK. <clears throat> the protocols um, define network addresses, globally unique network addresses, um, including construction of tables and the routing process on the network. So there's a, really a lot of complexity here um, that we'll see on a slide later on. Okay, so at the network layer, <clears throat> we have these um, already uh, two levels. Actually, it'll be easier for, to see it from here. At the network layer, we have network headers that include the addresses of where the packets are intended, and also normally the sender addresses there as well. So. These packets are nested inside of the data link layer packets, um, which include the, the MAC layer information, the MAC address, once they're being sent on a, a, physical, on a physical network. OK. Um, and IP addresses, as we said before, they're either statically assigned by somebody or they're uh, managed by uh, a naming service. OK. So both the destination address and the source address are included in that header. OK. <clears throat> so uh, a wide area network uh, is really a network of networks. Uh, so it's a set of different uh, networks that are glued together by routers that cover a large area, and these days the entire planet. So the internet itself is a single wide area network. Um, and it will include multiple uh, LANs and provide access from um, these days millions and actually, yeah, it would be billions of hosts now because there's billions of cell phones that have access. Um, and the hosts are connected by routers um, which use different technologies to communicate. All right, so routers um, are responsible for forwarding and depending on the type of router, they either um, forward the entire message. Sometimes they store the header only and then um, basically flow the rest of the message to forward. Um, or they capture the entire packet and then forward it uh, in order to, I don't know, uh, provide perhaps uh, error recovery um, before forwarding. And the forwarding table is a mapping between um, 
input addresses and output addresses. So it determines how a given node is going to forward packets that it receives. All right, so the router is, is, is basically a computer with typically its own operating system and uh, services that are running both to route things that it already knows about, route to hosts that it knows about. Um, and it's normally also spending a lot of its, a lot of resources communicating with other routers to determine uh, dynamically which are the best ways to move packets around. All right, so, <clears throat> um, and on receiving a packet, a, a router is going to read the destination address, look at the forwarding table, um, and send to the output port. All right, and there it goes. So, um, as we already said, the IP addresses are logical addresses. They encode the entire internet, and they're topologically ordered in a certain way. You know, they have a, essentially an address that, that's like uh, a physical address. There's um, a decreasing amount of locality in the address. So there's sort of local information at the beginning, global information at the end. Uh, IP addresses are just reversed. The global information's at the beginning. And the local information is at the end. And <clears throat> we already talked about why MAC addresses wouldn't work. They're not scalable. You'd have to record every potential MAC address in some massive table and pass that around. So it's just not practical for billions of addresses. Um, the MAC address you could think about as being something like a social security number for people. It has no geographic organization, whereas the IP addresses are organized <clears throat> in a kind of a course to find manner like uh, home addresses, just simply flipped. So, um, so the MAC address is supposed to be globally unique, though, so it does allow a unique mapping from IP address to physical address. Um, the IP address, though, um, can and does change. For instance, if you take your laptop from one location, one geographic location somewhere else on a plane, it's going to need um, a, a geographically appropriate address at the other place, so that's going to be different. Um, yeah, so it's a little bit like, right, uh, imagine as you move around, your social security number is going to go with you, but your ad address is going to change. All right. Um, yeah, well, we already said that uh, uh, the IP addresses have this geographic locality. So, for instance, at Berkeley, um, the IPv6 prefix is uh, A9E5. The old one was 128. Uh, so you can tell actually, that's actually unique. Those first four digits are unique. So any address that begins with that sequence is going to be a Berkeley address. So you can tell that the router um, in New York, if it sees it, this packet, all it needs to know is how to forward to Berkeley. And there's a few addresses in here. That's uh, what's 32, no, 16 bits. So there's thousands of addresses, but still it's a lot less than the full address space of IPv6. So having a table of, of these prefixes and knowledge of where to send simplifies the router's task enormously. All right, and so it only needs to know that Berkeley prefix and not the address of every node. <clears throat> and you know, that's analogous to knowing, um, let's say, a state address uh, if you're the postal service. That tells you how to forward the, the letter to an appropriate um, forwarding state facility that's then going to forward to the actual address, because that forward facility has the local routing information that you need. All right, so here's a high-level map of the internet these days. <clears throat> um, here, here we are down here, uh, and businesses are down here. The network that sits above us is typically partitioned into three tiers of networking provider. Um, the, the distinction is that tier one networks, once upon a time there used to be a, a global backbone of the intranet, <clears throat> which was originally managed by DARPA and then taken over by National Science Foundation. Um, but as the, the net grew and was commercialized largely, um, private providers have taken over uh, responsibility for this backbone. Um, but nevertheless, there's still a, a concept of a basically backbone level, which is 
the level through which most traffic goes and the level through which the lower level uh, services have to pay for transit. So level two ISPs have to normally rent uh, transit from the tier one providers. Um, and the tier one providers don't rent from anyone. They just possibly peer with other tier one services for efficiency and performance, um, but they don't have to pay for it. So there's relatively few of these. <coughs> Um, but they include companies like AT&T, Sprint, Verizon, um, and Tata Communications. Um, perhaps a few dozen of these at that scale. All right, so at the next level down, <coughs> um, they're often regional entities or Comcast. They're national, but they're, uh, they're relying on some of the other providers here for their tier one service. They don't implement end-to-end uh, networking of sufficient bandwidth to be a tier one provider. Um, okay. So um, even though with a, a relatively small, one, small number of these tier one and tier two providers, there's still a lot of complexity in routing. So um, we just saw that Berkeley is one of potentially <clears throat> about 65,000 uh, addresses at that first prefix. So it's still necessary for routers here to be able to find efficient paths between, let's say, lower level nodes that might be transiting them. So um, a, a lot of the complexity of the network now is in discovery and routing protocols. So ISIS is the protocol that's most commonly used for these high level providers, and basically it's a discovery protocol. Um, Routers here are communicating with each other using this protocol and telling each other about routes that they know <clears throat> to yet lower level uh, routers. And basically, each router gathers enough information to make its own map of part of the internet at high level. And given that, it then runs a simple algorithm, which is basically Dijkstra's algorithm, um, to find shortest routes to certain nodes. So that's what's going to go into its routing table. Um, and routers at the next level down do exactly the same thing. Um, the only difference is they're likely to have these tier one networks sort of predominating many of their routes. They'll forward to a tier one address before, um, before forwarding somewhere else. So in other words, the, the addresses that they'll route directly will be local to their jurisdiction. Everything else will go through a tier one. Um, all right, so <clears throat> um, now a, an issue here is that these different um, uh, domains here can have actually be running different protocols. Any given uh, commercial network like this one will run a particular protocol, and most of them are running this one. But say Comcast potentially can be running a different protocol from AT&T. So, in order to mediate between the different zones, there's another protocol called BGP, which is Border Gateway Pro Protocol. And, and that's specifically designed to arbitrate across the boundary between these domains. All right, so when you start to get an idea of the complexity, as we go down, there's a different discovery uh, protocol. It does something very similar to this um, ISIS protocol at high level in terms of talking to other routers, discovering short routes, and then populating um, the route table. And the main difference is this is better adapted to you know, large scale uh, backbone networks and this is better adapted to local networks. And you know, say within a business or um, within a, a local ISP. Um, okay, so a nice quote about standards that this slide sort of is suggesting. The nice thing about standards is that there are so many to choose from. Um, a quote from Andrew Tannenbaum. So, um, it is rather remarkable that, that the internet really works so well, but it does, and it does, it is because as, although there's a diversity of protocols, um, there are standards that they're all following, and it's enough to allow them to communicate, um, and certain common properties such as the, the idea routing tables themselves that are populated a lot of different ways, um, and a basic IP protocol allow this all to work. Okay. Okay, so um, still at the network layer, we have uh, IP is the basic 
sort of transport of the, uh, of the network. The basic communication packet is the IP packet. Uh, and it's an unreliable packet delivery protocol. Um, IP packet delivery is best effort, which means there's a, um, a destination address, uh, but packets may be lost or corrupted or delivered out of order. So you send and hope for the best and react. The, the higher level services are responsible for repairing things if packets are lost. All right. So. The interesting services, though, typically use um, higher level uh, packet services. And the idea is to, to provide an abstraction that includes, in particular, um, a process address or port address. So the transport layer is the, the level at which services are exposed, and therefore the, the port numbers that I showed you earlier are encoded in packets at this level. And that allows you to, to demultiplex services, meaning many, um, there's packets associated with many different services can go through the same communication link and then be decoded at the other end based on their port address. Um, the transport layer, this is where TCP lives, and so it can be responsible for reliability, um, sometimes timing properties in protocols like uh, RTP, which is a real-time protocol, and things like rate ad adaptation. So TCP does include flow control and congestion control. All right. Um, so the interface is both a network address and also a, a port address. Okay. And you know, so the main idea is to provide this uh, service address or port number and possibly the other uh, services that we listed up here. Okay. TCP and UDP both live here. TCP is the reliable transport, and UDP is uh, a simple connectionless datagram transport. So the port numbers which encode services um, basically uh, specify uh, an address. There's a convention about what certain addresses mean, but um, especially these higher addresses can be arbitrated by the two endpoints of the connection. Um, so, uh, but for the standard addresses, port 80 is uh, HTTP, probably the, yeah, certainly the most widely used uh, port number. And a host that exposes port 80 is, is saying, um, okay, I'm going to implement the HTTP protocol um, by listening on this port. All right, so <coughs> um, at the transport layer, now we have this transport header, which is going to include the port numbers, both sending and receiving port numbers, and then some data. Um, and you can see the nesting happening. So the highest levels of the protocol have the innermost nested headers um, as the packets are assembled going down the stack. So we have port number up here, and then um, IP address down here, and then finally MAC address at the bottom. So UDP is the, uh, you know, one workhorse of the internet. It's the simplest protocol uh, for uh, packet communication. And it's an, similar to IP. It's just a best effort protocol. You send a packet and hope for the best. Um, there's no ordering. There's no um, reliability guarantee. Um, TCP is the reliable protocol. It's widely used. Um, it includes sequence numbers on packets. So therefore, allows packets to be reordered at the receiver if they're received out of order. Um, it includes acknowledgment, so packet loss can be detected and repaired. Um, and it's a streaming protocol, a packet-based streaming protocol, which means that the idea is that there's a stable connection between two endpoints. So there's a state that's shared both at the sender and the receiver. Um, that persists between messages, unlike UDP where there's no state. Before and after a message is sent, uh, there's no change in the state. With TCP, you've got to establish certain state at both the sender and the receiver. Um, basically, they both run state machines that can tell which part of the protocol they've executed and where they're at. So establishing that state and maintaining it um, 
is essentially what's involved in uh, creating a connection or creating a, a socket connection at the two ends of the, of the TCP link. Um, <coughs> TCP can determine also um, through checksums that packets have been corrupted in transit and it will discard those and request retransmit. Um, <coughs> yeah, and it has both flow control and congestion control which are based on observing the acknowledgements coming back. Um, okay, so TCP doesn't re provide uh, performance or bandwidth or throughput guarantees. It can have very large delays because of the latency involved. Um, normally, a packet, it will keep retrying to transmit a packet that's not being acknowledged um, for a long time. So other protocols, though, um, provide this kind of service but not TCP IP. And normally, there's a trade-off between these two. Or there's a trade-off, rather, between reliability and delay slash bandwidth. Okay. Um, it is a statically addressed connection, though, so it, it won't survive a change of IP address if you move, did move your machine to a different domain. All right. So <clears throat> at the highest level, um, we have, uh, well, in OSI numbering, this would be level seven. Uh, in TCP PIP, it's the fifth level, a top level, um, and it's a service layer where services that are actually directly used by end users are exposed. Okay, and there's a very wide variety of interfaces associated with the application layer. And similarly, protocols are quite diverse. So they range all the way from uh, real-time communication used by Skype, uh, asynchronous, relatively slow um, forwarding, store and forward communication for email, web services, and custom protocols in Halo and BitTorrent and so on. Um, <clears throat> so in OSI, there are also session and presentation layers. Um, those improve modularity, but they come at a high performance cost. And so they're not normally, they're not implemented in the internet architecture. From the packet header wrapping that we saw earlier, you can see that this would imply, if we did have these two layers, um, two additional uh, wrapping steps to encode packets at these two layers for not a lot of added functionality or performance. So we just skip those two. All right. Um, so finally, the application layer, because of the diversity of services that might be involved, um, we're just showing these kind of packets as data packets. In practice, each protocol is probably going, well, inevitably is going to have its own headers. So HTTP will have custom headers in here. Um, but in order to make sense of the service at the other end, the uh, application layer will have to understand what kind of protocol is being sent. All right. All right. So to summarize that, we have uh, um, Lower three layers being implemented everywhere. Um, the top two layers implemented at hosts. Um, here we have routers taking care of these network data link and physical uh, layers. The hosts will be actually figuring out, exposing uh, endpoints, basically, and application functionality on top of the endpoints. All right, so the, there's a horizontal sort of compatibility here for every um, function that's initiated, say, at a client, there's a matching um, activity or service at the other end. So a socket connection here is always going to uh, talk to a socket connection at the other end. That socket layer will be interacting through uh, an API with application code at the higher level, and there should be a matching application here. So HTTP requests here have to be interpreted by um, an application HTTP service at the other end. All right, so <clears throat> um, the communication, though, is going uh, up and down. There will be a nested encapsulation of packets as they go down through the layers of the network, and adding the layer-specific information about, first of all, port address, um, IP address, uh, MAC address, and so on. Then the packets will get sent over the physical network 
Um, and then potentially, depending on the, uh, the technology, have new addresses added here because of a router. In order to get to this router, the IP address uh, would have been the address of the router. The forwarding address is going to have to be changed. So um, I guess we're showing, yeah. Yeah, so the IP address will have to be changed. The MAC address will also have to be changed to get to the next, get across the next link in the network. Finally, you'll get um, a fully encapsulated packet here, or sorry, here. And then you can strip off the layers which provide you with other information, especially the uh, source address, source IP address, and the source IP port um, that then the application can use, for instance, if it needs to send back replies, which it usually will. All right, any questions? Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm not sure you can do much with the, with the MAC address. So there are definitely um, protocols currently for high performance networking that, that try to bypass these layers in order to get higher performance. So um, one of them is uh, this something called RDMA, which is remote DMA, which uh, is like establishing a TCP connection, but once the connection's established, it uh, it, it strips away all of these layers and basically writes large blocks of bits into a buffer that, that is then sent out at the lower layers. So there are ways of making this more efficient. Um, but I, I, I think it doesn't normally extend as far as, as MAC addresses. It's got to be, basically this is normally understood by hardware anyway. So normally the, the bypassing, if it happens, is happening at these higher layers. All right, so the internet has the structure roughly of an hourglass. So we talked about the layering as being an approach to minimize the potential n squared blow up of uh, interaction between different services and uh, physical networking layers down here. You can see it's uh, like a tree. And in fact, everything goes through IP because it wouldn't be sufficient just to have um, a layering structure, because unless the layers are somehow shrinking as you go up or down, you'll still have an n squared blow up. So the idea is you go down, you're actually decreasing the number of protocols that you'll be using um, down to the IP level and then branching out again uh, with less interaction between random protocols at different layers. So that kind of double tree structure or uh, hourglass structure minimizes the number of potentially different types of layer interaction that you need to worry about. So, and typically, well actually, the application layers often, um, application layer protocols will often work with both TCP and UDP, but they're normally using one for preference to provide a, a appropriate quality of service. Um, <coughs> 802.11 is a radio protocol, so uh, it's really only used with wireless. Um, Ethernet ha now has a couple of popular um, physical transports. There's both um, copper Ethernet, which is the Ethernet you probably have in your machines. Uh, copper really uh, is struggling above a gigabit per second, and so m many of the newer technologies from 10 to gigabits and above, <coughs> which should be coming out, so they're currently only in um, data center level communications, but they should be um, uh, hitting the end user application space pretty soon. These will probably be fiber. It's just physically much harder to move bits at that speed. But anyway, they'll still be running Ethernet, which means it'll be simple to um, interoperate those devices with Ethernet, Ethernet infrastructure that people already have. All right, so <clears throat> um, the IP the narrow waste allows uh, a kind of a funneling and a simplification of the potentially quadratic interoperability problem. So um, yeah, it allows um, a nice multiplexing of the high level functions with the low level technologies um, and allows applications that use IP to run on any physical network. 
um, again, it has the usual uh, advantages of abstraction, which allows innovations in any p layer of the network um, without changing the core protocol. Every lifetime, though, once in a lifetime, though, when you, you have a basic uh, uh, core protocol like IP, it, it, it has to change in order to, to deal with the increase in size of the internet. So the transition from IPv4 to IPv6 has been pretty massively disruptive. But anyway, uh, 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 that's an inevitable glitch. The good properties of this uh, hourglass model, though, are still going to persist. And eventually, things will settle down on IPv6 and still be simple again. All right, so um, some disadvantages of layering. Um, <clears throat> we end up doing a lot of work and a lot of uh, copying, actually, in implementing these layers and adding headers progressively, and often fragmenting packets as well. The ideal size of packets <clears throat> is often decreasing as you go down in the layer. For Ethernet, it's 15, about 1,500 bytes. Larger layers typically have larger packets. Um, so all of that hurts performance. Um, and the headers can get quite large because you're nesting many layers of them. The headers can easily become larger than the content. If they're small messages, you have already dozens of uh, bytes of header. Yeah? Um, no, the, the packets are smaller, typically. I mean, Ethernet's limited to 1,500 byte packets. So the larger level protocols are normally, I think, um, I think IP is limited to, uh, it has a 16 bit length field, so it's limited to 65K bytes. Um, higher levels, I think, I'm, well, I'm not sure, but the higher levels, I think, can support larger packets. But anyway, definitely to get to the physical layer, um, the packet size is quite small. Um, the reason is that it, uh, if packets are too large at the, um, the very lowest layers, you introduce latency by having to send a, you know, a, a long packet before anyone else can send. The idea, though, is the lowest level is supposed to multiplex a lot of communication. So you want packet sizes to be small. Yeah, Chris. Yeah. Right. The, the he yeah, so the headers are going to add size, especially as you fragment packets. So the overhead of headers is getting bigger. It's still, though, typically um, a few percent. If, if you have a full size Ethernet packet, it's still, header size is still a small um, fraction of the size. The difficulty is if you're sending very small packets, they're going to be small all the way down, and then the headers will dominate. So, you know, acknowledgement packets have this problem. And, you know, TCP has a lot of those. Um, all right, so, <coughs> um, <coughs> yeah, so we have a problem that uh, uh, you may have duplication of fu layer functionality. So error recovery is something that you might um, want to implement at several layers. Most wireless networks have uh, either forward error correction or their own error recovery protocol. It's also going to be built into TCP. Um, and sometimes higher level protocols have it as well, uh, t potentially to deal with the high latencies of, of, H of TCP. Some layers are going to want the same information. Um, you may want higher level layers to understand what the MTU is. So that's the maximum packet size. So for Ethernet, that's the f currently 1,500 bytes, roughly. Um, so there's a, a, a push to b increase the size of the MTU for, e for uh, Ethernet and for the intermediate uh, network layers. So 1500 is the default that's implemented almost everywhere. You can get higher throughput <coughs> by using longer MTUs, but that has to be uh, possible at every layer of the network. Because once you, once you um, hit a layer that can't transmit a large sized packet at, at, at the, uh, the, um, the physical layer, you're going to just get a block. You'll basically get the packet being stored there. So the router has to determine end to end what the uh, guaranteed MTU size is. So there's negotiation. If you, um, if you check routes using 
There are custom uh, trace route tools which will tell you what the sustained transmission unit size is. So higher level protocols can make use of that um, and choose their packetization adaptively to best use the physical layer. Okay, so all right, let's review some of this. Uh, um, so for layering, um, does layering improve application performance? Right, we saw that before. Okay, what about um, <clears throat> routers forward packets based on destination address? Yeah. Um, best effort packet delivery, I, IP or UDP guarantees uh, packets are delivered in order. Right, it's in fact really, uh, those packets don't even have sequence numbers, so it's not even really feasible. Okay, port numbers belong to the network layer. Right, there's a transport layer. Um, and hosts on Berkeley campus share the same IP address prefix. True, all right. All right, um, so to summarize, we uh, talked about the layered architecture and how it provides um, a way of managing a very large and complex set of protocols. We went through the um, physical, uh, the layers of the internet, the five layers from physical through data link, which is designed for physical media, includes MAC addresses, the network layer that includes the IP addresses of hosts, um, and transport layer, which is starting to expose and support services that didn't include a, a port address in addition to the IP address. And finally, the applications that sit on top of those, but which have relatively a very simple interface in that they're talking to just one of the uh, two major transport layers, typically. All right, so, um, so this somewhat complicated process uh, is made transparent, or ra rather made invisible to the application author who only has to worry about their communication with the high-level um, networking interfaces. All right, we'll stop there. <laughs>